Hello, everyone. Hi. Let's settle down. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Jay Wallace from the Department of Philosophy, and it's my pleasure to welcome so many of you back uh, here today for the second of our Tanner Lectures on Human Values. Uh, the first lecture yesterday by Rachel Barney was absolutely exhilarating, and I know you uh, are join me in tremendous excitement about today's lecture. I'm not going to do a second introduction of Rachel, so we'll just cut directly to the chase. Her topic uh, in the second lecture will be craft, metier, and utopia. Rachel. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for being here. Uh, you're going to see that my technological capacities have blossomed since yesterday. <laughs> and we are actually going to start uh, not even with a slide, but with a little uh, video clip to warm you up and remind you of our topic. So let's see if we can make this work. Yeah. Well, but you were being sarcastic when you said he loved the mines. You know, really, you, you really I didn't know anyone loved He's talking about his father. To, oh, yes. Like, uh, oh, yes. My, my, my father, who was apparently a great miner, uh, is in the days before mechanization and so on, uh, when you got the great seam, there's a, there's a great seam, a famous seam, a, a world famous one, which I believe is called the Great Atlantic Fault. And it starts in uh, northern Spain in the Basque country and it goes under the Bay of Biscay and it comes up in South Wales and it goes under the Atlantic and comes up in Pennsylvania so that if you took a Basque miner or a Welsh miner or a Pennsylvania miner and if you could blindfold them and transport them and they know the, the coal face the minute they saw it, it's, it I believe it's four feet six inches and my father used to talk about it as some men will talk about women talk about the beauty of this cold face. And my brothers would tell me stories about my father um, who would look at the seam. My father's a very short man, an ideal height for a man. He was about five feet three or four. Very, very powerful, of course. And he would look at the, uh, at the seam of coal and he would, as to uh, almost surgically make a mark on it. And then ask his boy, every miner has a boy who works for him. Yeah. And he would say, give me the number two mandrel. That's a half-headed pick. <clears throat> and then, having stared at this gorgeous display of black, shining ribbon of coal, he would then hit it with one enormous blow. And if he hit it right, something like 20 tons of coal would fall out from the coal face. Really? So that it was thrilling, it was exciting. And indeed, that's why I think when you perhaps think of me as being born uh, with a silver spoon and so on, uh, miners uh, believe themselves, or believed themselves anyway, to be the, uh, the uh, aristocrats of the working class. They felt superior to all other kinds of manual laborers. They were skilled workers. That cold face was a, was a magical creature. Has that all been replaced now by mechanized... Yes, you drill uh, things now and you... Lost some of the romance. Of, of years. That's what your father would probably be against that. Uh, yeah, well, he wouldn't say that. He'd say they're not miners at all now. They're just... Uh, machines do the work. Machines do yeah. the work, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that clip is a reminder of what we're here to discuss. Uh, techne, big craft, uh, including not just pottery and weaving, but being a surgeon, flying an airplane, and as it turns out, old school coal mining. I should say, actually, I have no idea whether anything he says is true in that <laughs> clip. I haven't independently researched uh, any of it, um, but that's not really the point. Um, I like that clip uh, in part because I like listening to Richard Burton's voice, uh, but also as a reminder that there's nothing class-bound about uh, big craft and that it doesn't have to be pretty. Or rather, uh, I would say that all craft is beautiful, but that beauty is not always apparent uh, to the outsider, to the person who doesn't practice it themselves. 
And I also enjoy the digressiveness of that clip, the way he gets into really describing the beauty of that coal face, because to me that's very expressive of uh, the paradigmatic uh, attitude of the true craftsperson. And it's important that that attitude is contagious. Uh, clearly the father communicated his love of uh, that coal face to the son, and Burton can communicate it to us as well. Uh, just one note before we start today, uh, I've been tinkering in small ways with the phrasing of this talk uh, down to the wire. So if you hear either commentator cite me saying something that you didn't hear me say, um, it is something that I believe, apparently. Um, <laughs> and uh, any gaps in our phrasing are my uh, fault, so my, apologize, uh, my apologies if that does happen. Okay, so last time I offered you a sketch of techne. Uh, of our everyday understanding of it, as I claimed. And I argued, following Plato, that craft so understood is teleological. It's oriented to an end, and that end is not contingent on the will of the individual practitioner. It's in relation to that end that craft determines which actions are correct. The person who reliably does those correct actions well is the good practitioner, the competent one. If they do them with elegance, then they're an excellent practitioner, or even a great one. Further norms radiate out from this triangle of end, action, and agent. The craftsperson's tools are well chosen or not. Their education was effective or not. The institutions which house the craft are in good working order, or they're degraded or oppressed. In the end, a whole society can stand judged by whether it's uh, an appropriate vehicle uh, for a craft. So for instance, Aristotle, in a surprising moment of radicalism, holds that the best flute players in a society ought to be given the best flutes. <laughs> That's what he says. To grasp a particular techne in full would be to understand in detail what it takes for this whole network of radiating norms to be satisfied in its case. So craft is a normative concept in a very straightforward way. It's stuffed with normative content. I would even say it's structured around this network of norms. But of course we can grasp a concept as being normative in this sense, as having normative content, without accepting that it's normative for us, that it's genuinely authoritative. So race hygiene is a normative concept in the sense that it has normative content. Uh, so is the white man's burden. So are lots of concepts that we don't accept as being genuinely normative uh, upon us or upon any rational person. So there's a second, stronger thing that we might mean when we say that craft is normative, namely that we endorse its normative content, that we take it as genuinely authoritative, authoritative binding, uh, for us. And I take it that we do think that craft is normative in this second, stronger sense. Uh, we think that if you're a shoemaker, you ought to be a good shoemaker. So my starting point for today is with the simple question of why that is. I'll be addressing this question again in terms of craft as work, a single concept, for it's in the case of the working practitioner that this normativity is most evident. And I'm going to use the somewhat nostalgic example of the shoemaker. So according to the great uh, historian Eric Hobsbawm, the shoemaker was traditionally uh, the village intellectual and also the village radical. And I thought Hobsbawm was just sort of making this up. I came across this uh, offhand comment and then I found he has a whole paper uh, co-written with Joan Scott on political shoemakers. And it's about the famous radical intellectual shoemakers of the 19th century, which was actually a thing. Uh, so I highly recommend that amazing paper, if you're interested. And what makes it doubly amazing is that this tradition seems to go back several millennia, uh, in that Socrates is said to have been friends with Simon the Shoemaker. And philosophical discussions in antiquity, uh, dialogues were circulated under the name of Simon. And of course, modern scholars assumed that this was uh, a fantasy based on Plato's use of craft analogies in his dialogues. And then uh, American archeologists actually discovered the workshop of Simon. Yeah. You were being sarcastic. Um, so there we go. Uh, property of Simon, that's on the bottom of a cup. And there you can see the little uh, eyelets and nails and so on uh, in the workshop in the Agora. So I'm going to be calling my question uh, today the shoemaker's question. The question of why should I be a good shoemaker? And the puzzle it raises is the puzzle of the shoemaker's art. So again, the odd is if you're a shoemaker, you ought to make good shoes, or try to anyway. And the shoemaker's question is a demand for explanation and justification of that. 
So I'm going to be um, exploring this question of why craft is normative in this second stronger sense of actually being authoritative or binding on the practitioner. Another phrase I'll use is to say that craft norms actually go through. Uh, they don't just apply to the, to the metaphysical abstraction, the shoemaker. They apply to real people who are actually engaged in making shoes. To say that craft norms go through is also to say that they generate real duties or obligations. But I'm going to go a long time without using the word moral, because I think it's unclear whether the kind of obligation we're looking at is moral, quasi-moral, or something else. And if you're wondering what a non-moral ought might be, um, well, we normally take it that norms of politeness um, create obligations, maybe kind of small ones, but they have a certain genuine authority. Uh, the law obliges us also. Um, so too, very differently, uh, do norms of rationality. So there are lots of, uh, in my picture, there are lots of oughts out there. And uh, these other kinds aren't necessarily identical with, they don't even reliably entail moral obligation. That's something a bit special. And the shoemaker's ought, uh, like the oughts of politeness uh, and law, seems a bit uh, ambiguous, uncertain in its relation to morality. If we imagine Simon in a tough situation where his obligation to make good shoes somehow, con somehow comes into conflict with a moral duty, say not to commit murder, um, and I admit I have trouble spelling out <laughs> what the situation would be in any detail, but um, surely we would see this situation as one in which there's a moral norm which would override obligations of some other quite different and lesser kind. Still, the shoemaker's ought isn't irrelevant to morality either. One way of expressing the idea that the norms of shoemaking go through to the person is that the good person who's a shoemaker will try to make good shoes, at least all else being equal. So it seems to me that craft norms do have some kind of authority, and my question is going to be what kind and where it comes from. Before trying to address that pair of questions, I want to take a look again at what we might call negative space, at where normativity fails. For it fails where it ought to, in the case of what we might call the bad crafts, that rogues gallery of the expert pickpocket, the assassin, the mafioso, whose great philosophical spokesman is Robert G in the Zhuangzi. So if you, re if you really want to see the, um, the point of view uh, put well, look at that text. According to the Platonic account, of course, these aren't crafts at all. They fail the requirement of making a contribution to the common good. But they have much of the social and epistemic profile of a craft, and they seem to have a kind of normative content, too. We all know from the movies what actions are prescribed for the mafioso and what makes him count as good at his job. So here are two arguments. And I hope that's actually legible, uh, at least a, a fair way back. Um, so I'm giving up my secret weapon here of, of illegible slides. I hope you appreciate that <laughs> gesture of trust. Um, argument A, uh, Leela is a shoemaker. A good shoemaker makes fine shoes. A shoemaker should be a good shoemaker. Therefore, Leela should, should be a good shoemaker and make fine shoes. Argument B, uh, Alberto is a mafioso. A good mafioso murders whenever ordered to do so. A mafioso should be a good mafioso, therefore Alberta should be a good mafioso and murder whenever ordered to do so. And this is completely irrelevant, but uh, I have in mind here uh, Alberto Latuada's great movie uh, Il Mafioso, starring Alberto Sordi, that's why it's Alberto here. Uh, and actually in the, in the film, the character, uh, well, he's, A, he's not called Alberto, and actually he's a harmless factory manager in Turin who, gets, who takes a visit to his home village and gets bullied and manipulated into doing a single uh, job. Um, so I'm actually pretty uneasy with films that I ask you to identify with committed mafiosi. This is a, a somewhat different example. Now, this second argument, I hope, we're agreed, is unsound. Leela's work gives rise to genuine obligations. Alberto's doesn't. And it isn't that he has prima facie duties, qua mafioso, which are, however, overridden when his orders happen to violate moral norms. Also, Alberto also isn't obliged to walk the dawn's dog or deliver, dawn, uh, deliver flowers to his mother on her birthday. He isn't obliged to do anything qua mafioso. The logic of the arguments is trickier than it looks because the two middle premises on the right, B2 and B3, as on the left, uh, look true if read as craft generics or as being about that metaphysical abstraction, the mafioso, and its fuller specification, the good mafioso. But if we understand the third premise as a universal generalization into which we can put Alberto as an instance or any other human being, it becomes false. 
If you wake up one day to find yourself a mafioso, as per Alberto more or less does, you should direct your efforts to becoming not a mafioso as quickly as possible, not towards getting better at it. So in argument A, the should, as I'm putting it, goes through to Leela. On the right, it doesn't go through to Alberto. And the most economical explanation of why is the one Plato offers. Being a mafioso simply isn't a craft, and it can't generate obligations in the way crafts do. So I'm going to be keeping th things simple for the rest of today by carrying over from last time this platonic conception on which every real craft provides a genuine benefit to society, and that can be used, out, uh, used to weed out um, the bad cases. OK, so returning now to the real crafts, why should a shoemaker try to be a good shoemaker, one who makes good shoes? Once set out, we might think that this shoemaker's question sounds like the kind of question that sort of short circuits and answers itself. It's a bit like, uh, is the Pope Catholic? Um, of course, I know people who think that the Pope isn't Catholic. Um, so these questions do actually have some, some content to them. Uh, but still, being a shoemaker seems to be an identity built around a practice which is constituted, at least in part, by the norms of shoemaking embedded in it. And there's arguably a still more basic underlying point about agency here. In most contexts, trying to do something just is trying to do that thing correctly. And there seems to be a slippery slope between making a shoe well, making it not so well, making it badly, and failing to make a shoe at all. So it might seem that there's something incoherent or self-undermining, or at least kind of risky, about trying to make a shoe but not trying to make a good one. And this suggests that the normativity of craft is a brute matter of the teleological structure of human agency. Call this the very simple answer. If you're a shoemaker, you ought to be a good shoemaker, because shoemaking is what you're trying to do, and the norms for that action just are what they are. Now, I think that the simple answer, the very simple answer, is basically right. But it doesn't seem to get us very far. It doesn't seem to have anything explanatory or persuasive to say to the shoemaker who's worried, worried about the rent and wondering whether to cut corners. So let's see what more we might be able to offer. One kind of more ambitious answer would locate the authority of craft in its status as a profession and in the idea of contract. The shoemaker, after all, professes to her neighbors her readiness to make their shoes. When customers come in, she contracts to do so and gets paid for her work. Carried far enough, not doing your job properly is fraud. This seems point missing, however. At any rate, the legal norms of contract apply equally firmly to oppressed and exploitive labor, bullshit jobs, other kinds of work which, in my view anyway, oblige us only very weakly, if at all. Shoemaking seems importantly different from those subnormative jobs. But the concept of profession isn't very apt for bringing the difference out. For one thing, I profess my craft to other people. But the shoemaker's good work seems somehow owed to the job itself, not or not only to the customer. An expert is expected to have a certain autonomous punctiliousness, to care about doing the job well, whether anyone's watching or not. That's part of the dignity of craft. It's even part of what gets professed by the craftsperson, I think. We want to hire the plumber or the dentist who cares about the details we can't ourselves see and might not care about if we could. Contract seems be beside the point there. The same objection applies to the more abstract but related idea, a topic beloved of moral philosophers, promising. It's true that when I profess my craft, I make a kind of promise to my potential customers, and breaking promises is wrong. But it's still not wrong in the right kind of way. Contract and promise are superstructure. They depend on the prior ability of craft norms themselves to bind. And what those norms bind the craftsperson to is really the job itself. So uh, second section, I'm going to move on to a different uh, kind of answer to the shoemaker's uh, question. And with a different starting point, which I think is more promising, which is the concept of a metier. A metier is a skilled job, but it doesn't depend on any particular contract. It's not clear to me that it has to be paid employment at all, though in French it standardly is. Still, the word always puts me in mind of the wonderful line of the poet Heinrich Heine. On his deathbed, after a somewhat rackety life, uh, Heine reassured his wife, ne t'inquiète pas, chérie, Dieu me pardonnera, c'est son métier. Don't worry, darling, God will pardon me, that's his job. <laughs> so metier here is usually translated as job, but that's ambiguous and perhaps misleading. Heine isn't claiming to have God under contract, like an iffy plumber who'd better show up. 
uh, that would be blasphemous in the extreme, which under the circumstances he was probably trying to avoid. <laughs> Heine's point was rather that God can be trusted to do his self-appointed work and do it well. This nuance of self-selection, suggesting a taste for the work itself, is marked by the way that Metier, like Kraft, travels with the person, getting relativized as mine or his. This ongoing possession by the agent is understood, I think, as a psychological reality. We think of it as a matter of identification and self-conception. But it's also something public-facing, a matter of creating and inhabiting a specialized identity. Someone makes a metier their own <laughs> through an apprenticeship, induction into the guild, and publicly legible acts of profession. That's where the professing fits in, is very late in the game. It's by doing all this work that Simon succeeds in building himself a specialized new self as an agent, Simon the Shoemaker. Now this suggests another strategy for answering the shoemaker's question. For having a metier, being in an ongoing way self-identified as a shoemaker, a baker, a firefighter, that's very much a social role. And many social roles have normative content which does seem to go through. Think of mother, friend, neighbor. A number of philosophical theories have been built around the idea that you ought to perform your role, your social roles, simply because the norms of it are what they are and the role is yours. This idea becomes more plausible if we mix in the language of function in Greek ergon and think of society as made up of such functions or offices or stations, each validated by its contribution to the whole. It's possible to get that view out of Plato's vision of the just city in the Republic, read in a somewhat reductive spirit, but for the full flavor, we should turn to the classical Chinese philosopher Han Fei. So here's a little parable for you. <coughs> Marquis Zhao of Han once became drunk and fell asleep. The steward of Caps, seeing that his ruler was cold, placed the Marquis's cloak over him. When Marquis Zhao awoke, he was pleased by this and asked his attendant, who covered me with my cloak? His attendants replied, it was the steward of Caps. Consequently, the ruler punished both the steward of Caps and the steward of cloaks. He punished the steward of cloaks because he felt the man had failed to fulfill his appointed task. And he punished the steward of Caps because he felt the man had overstepped the bounds of his position. It was not that the Marquis did not dislike the cold, but rather that he felt that the harm that comes from ministers encroaching on each other's office is even greater than the harm that comes from being cold. So you can build a whole political philosophy around that principle, actually. And um, I commend Han Fei to you if you want to see how that works. An equally radical conclusion is reached from a somewhat different angle by the 19th century British Hegelian F.H. Bradley in his notorious essay, My Station and Its Duties. The argument re relies on a Hegelian understanding of the state as a superorganism of which the individual human is just a part, uh, the good of which is realized in functioning, which contributes to the good of the whole. Bradley concludes his argument by saying rhapsodically, we have found the end that's to say the end of, of human life, the telos. We have found self-realization, duty, and happiness in one. Yes, we have found ourselves when we have found our station and its duties, our function as an organ in the social organism. Now, I think that Bradley's talk of self-realization actually gets at something important, which I'll come back to later. But the claim that self-realization comes simply from the acceptance of my station and its duties is, to use a technical philosophical term for once, bananas. <laughs> there are at least two obvious objections to it. One is that there are all sorts of social roles which no one should feel bound by. These include, again, the bad crafts, but also many more. Handmaid springs to mind, or house elf. Part of the purpose of imaginative fiction is, I think, to sharpen our skills at recognizing these kinds of uh, bad and oppressive social roles in our own societies. Bad social roles ones which can only be at home in a corrupt or oppressive society, oblige nothing but resistance. And so for the shoemaker's question, social role or function, taken just as such, looks hopeless as an answer. What it picks out is what the shoemaker, the handmaid, and the mafioso have in common. So it can't explain why the norms of the one role go through and the others don't. The second obvious problem with Bradley and with any account of obligation organized around social roles is related. Most aspects of my station in life are given. My nationality, parentage, in many societies far more, including my line of work. So to treat roles or stations as giving norms that go through to the person 
is to give no weight at all to freedom of choice. But we do think that it has some weight. Now, I find it helpful to think of this freedom requirement in terms of Christine Korsgaard's conception of practical identities. To be clear, this is part of a very uh, complex and profound uh, moral theory, which is designed by Korsgaard to solve uh, very different problems. And I'm just going to uncover uh, a tiny corner of it for our purposes here and look forward to her uh, saying more about it in the comments. For Korsgaard, practical identities are the guises under which we exercise agency and constitute ourselves as agents. For me to act at all, I have to have a self-conception under which I value my actions and ends. And that means having, quote, a description under which you value yourself, a description under which you find your life to be worth living and your actions to be worth undertaking. Practical identities are those descriptions, and they have authority because they give us reasons to act, including obligations. And Course Guard is careful to distinguish these from uh, moral obligations, which are uh, special. Our local practical identities are contingent, and they define, as she puts it in an interesting phrase, contingent forms of duty and the noble. Metiers and occupational roles generally are paradigm cases of practical identities. And there are a pair of broadly course guardian thoughts about them that I want to adopt here. One is her understanding of how a practical identity, for our purposes, a craft adopted as a metier, comes to be mine. Course guard fully acknowledges that some practical identities, including crafts, may be inherited or acquired by happenstance. She tends to speak of such identities as being contingent uh, rather than as being free. Still, she presents the holding of a practical identity as involving a kind of ongoing commitment. You have to endorse um, not only the values provided by the identity, but the identity itself as having value. And valuing and endorsing are paradigmatically free operations of practical reason. Moreover, she emphasizes that a contingent practical entity comes with what we might call a right of exit. Uh, you can drop them. Uh, if you cease to find them a source of value. So it seems fair to say uh, that having a practical identity, such as a metier, is dependent on my free adoption and reflective endorsement of it. So that's what I want to adopt as um, a single course guardian thought and integrate uh, into my account of uh, craft. Its normative authority depends on our free adoption and reflective endorsement. And that's actually, I think, compatible um, sort of empirically with uh, the ways in which people do get in to crafts, um, even though those are, can be very contingent. We could talk about that during the discussion. The second course guardian point I want to use is the thought that we ought to drop the practical identities which conflict with our moral identity as human beings. And here she conveniently mentions the assassin, so we know we're on the right track. Um, as she puts it, moral identity exerts a kind of governing role over the other kinds. Practical conceptions of your identity which are fundamentally inconsistent with the value of humanity it's a Kantian note being struck there, must be given up. In other words, a bad craft or a bad metier cannot oblige. Note that this leaves the normativity of the shoemaker's art in the kind of ambiguous zone uh, that we saw before. It's neither fully moral nor entirely unmoral. And Course Guard's account um, can explain why. She has some helpful phrasing such as uh, saying that our moral identity as human beings stands behind our practical identities. And she says that part of the normative authority of a practical identity comes from this relation to human identity. So that's perhaps frustratingly vague, but it sounds right to me that there is um, a kind of standing behind uh, relation uh, between the two kinds of uh, identity. So the basic idea here is that um, the idea of a metier as a practical identity seems to me to offer a good path for explaining the normative authority of craft, explaining why craft norms go through. Um, it's a better uh, theoretical route than the idea of contract or profession or mere social role. There's a big problem in applying this idea, however. The problem is how to judge whether something, a metier or anything else, uh, is my practical identity. In particular, it's unclear how far this is a matter simply of psychological states, such as valuing and endorsing, and how far it's a matter of sociological fact. In a good case, of course, the two will come together. They'll be bridged by a coherent pattern of behavior on my part. My actions will express my values, and my identities will be made manifest in social roles um, which fit. But it's all too easy for these factors to come apart. Suppose, for instance, that our Alberto, instead of being trapped into the life of a mafioso, has the good fortune to be heir to a firm of biscotti manufacturers. 
but also suppose that he studied philosophy at university and would quite like to continue with that after the laurea. Succumbing to family pressure, however, he returns home for the summer, and so same fatal mistake, and without ever making what feels like a decision, he starts to take over responsibilities on the fattoria floor. On what conditions and at what point does biscotti maker become one of his practical identities? How can Alberto himself answer that question as he reflects in the cool of the evening five years later, alone with his grappa and his self-pity? <laughs> Is it really simply a question of how much he now cares about biscotti? I mean, even that might not be easy for him to establish simply by introspection. There's all kinds of confounding variables. But you can imagine his siblings getting kind of irritated um, by that introspective process and saying, look, the, the case is actually very simple. You are, in fact, a biscotti manufacturer now, so step up and be a good one. Um, they're unlikely to be sympathetic if he protests that, well, no, actually, I've read Course Guard, and I, I don't think this is my practical identity, and uh, so I don't have any obligations. Now, one might respond that if being a biscotti mat maker isn't an identity for Alberto five years later, if he doesn't endorse that practical identity, then something else has gone wrong. He's behaving with a lack of authenticity, we might say, or integrity. And that response seems to me actually to be right. But it doesn't seem to me to capture the shoemaker's art. What's bad about making shoes badly is the bad shoes, not the inauthentic state of the shoemaker's soul. The more plausible alternative view is to take practical identities as somewhat external and socially manifest, to hold that Alberto is indeed bound by the norms of biscotti making from the moment that he sits down in his father's big chair. This may seem like a regress to the social roles view of craft normativity, which I rejected earlier. But in fact, I'm proposing a more radical regress still, all the way back to what I called the very simple answer. Anyone engaged in the practice of biscotti making or shoe making ought to try to make good shoes, not because it's their profession or their social role or their metier or their practical identity, but simply because it's the thing they're doing. And that thing is a craft and craft norms apply. I'm suggesting that the, craft, that the shoemakers ought has at the most basic level, no more of an explanation than that. Now, section three, I'm going to move on to what I'm calling uh, the best case scenario. And, uh, well, you'll see what I mean by that phrase as we go. Now, to say what I just did, that really the very simple answer is the only answer there is, uh, isn't to say that the other answers we've been looking at have nothing to offer. They just need to be relocated a bit. Where they're helpful is not in relation to the shoemaker's question, as I initially posed it, but in relation to what we might think of as the follow-up question, which we can now more clearly distinguish. So the follow-up question is, well, why should I be a shoemaker? Granted that the shoemaker ought to make good shoes, why is that a role that I or any rational person would identify with and attempt to instantiate? So I spoke last time of the uh, idea that craft practitioners have different kinds of external motivations for doing what they do. And I said there was the originating motivation that gets you into a craft, the sustaining motivation that keeps you in it, and uh, the prompt which causes you to practice it on a particular uh, occasion. And I'm now zeroing in on sustaining motivations. Those are what we're going to be talking about uh, when we address this follow-up question. Why should I actually go to the workshop today and uh, pursue this identity of um, being a shoemaker? And the question is whether we can say anything at this very high level of abstraction about what the right kind of sustaining motive would be. What's a good answer uh, to that question uh, that the shoemaker asks herself when she reflects? And this is an inquiry into how craft as work might be normative in yet another, a third sense, the sense in which something is normative if it um, meets the standard for the kind of thing that it is, um, so that it's uh, desirable, uh, a normative uh, kind of thing for us, in this case, a normative kind of work, of making a living. Now, as I flagged earlier, a useful starting point here is Bradley's claim that social roles op operate through offering self-realization to their occupants. I've said that he can't be right about what self-realization consists in, and I have to admit the whole concept of self-realization gives me qualms. It's um, reminiscent of sappy self-help books. Um, makes me feel that we're, we're straying into the wrong section of the bookstore here. Um, but uh, I think it is a valuable concept. I think it's kind of the term that we're stuck with for uh, a certain kind of uh, ideal, even if it isn't the right, quite the right kind of word for that thing. Um, so 
I say it's not necessarily the right kind of word because we all have parts of ourselves that we think should be squelched, that we don't want realized. And what's more, some of the more compelling versions of the idea, the one we might attribute to Nietzsche, for instance, are more about self-overcoming, self-transcendence. Um, Korsgaard prefers the term self-constitution. So there are lots of options, um, but as I say, I think uh, self-realization has become sort of uh, the default for an ideal which is indeed a promising candidate for happiness, or at least for the kind of happiness which it makes sense for us to aim at in action. So I'm leaving room here for the Aristotelian thought that to be happy, you might also need to be lucky and have external goods. Um, but I'm going to, from now on, talk about the kind of happiness that we can actually aim at attaining through our own activities. Self-realization, I take it, names a way of living in which I successfully use my talents, interests, propensities, opportunities, perhaps even my flaws and disadvantages to do good work and lead a worthwhile life, to make something of myself, as they say. It's inherently a normative concept, tethered on the one side to an ideal of flourishing our happiness, which it promises, and on the other to an ideal of right action, which it demands. To speak of self-realization is thus to hypothesize something that uh, virtually all the ancient philosophers uh, were committed to, namely a convergence of virtue and happiness in the most abstract senses of acting well and faring well. Now, the moment the idea is on the table, I think it's pretty obvious that self-realization is something that can be offered by a metier, and by craft as a metier in particular. After all, as Aristotle says in the opening of his Metaphysics, all human beings desire by nature to know. I have a friend who insists that he actually means that we all desire to know things by nature without having to work at it. <laughs> but I'm confident that's not actually the correct way to parse that Greek <laughs> sentence. What he means is it's a feature of human nature that we want to know things by finding them out. Uh, we also like to use our knowledge productively in action. We take pleasure in getting things right, doing things well, hitting the coal face at exactly the right angle, especially where it's something that other people can't do. There's a further rich satisfaction in having that distinctive knowledge and rightness acknowledged by others and not to mention getting paid for it. What more could anyone want? Of course, that's a thin and inadequate sketch of what self-realization might be. It may not be fair to take feelings of satisfaction or fulfillment as proxies for real self-realization. Um, and But a sense of fulfillment, I think, does seem like the best introspectable sign uh, of self-realization that we're likely to get. We can perhaps get a more vivid picture by watching a documentary about a craftsperson at work, which is a tellingly huge genre. There's also the psychological literature on the idea of flow, with its phenomenology of expert performance, depicting the expert at the height of their powers, using all of their knowledge and skills to solve problems, overcome difficulties, acting effortlessly as if time itself slowed down for them. This is, for almost anybody, an extraordinarily attractive ideal. Not all expert performance looks like that, of course, and I wouldn't want to say that self-realization necessarily manifests in the condition of flow or make the value of one contingent on the other. For someone born into an oppressive society, a life of self-realization might involve terrible pain. And the creative struggles of the great artist might feel hard and be hard and stay that way, seen from the inside as well as from without. But the image of the self-realizing craftsperson in a state of flow is still the best image we have of how the ideal of the ancient philosophers might be realized, how a kind of virtue or excellence and a kind of happiness could be made to coincide by the active exercise of the one bringing about the other. I've argued in earlier work that it's fair to attribute an ideal of self-realization along these very general lines to Plato in the Republic and to Aristotle, and that this is part of what they use the craft model to bring out. The Greek way to put it is in terms of a person's ergon, their function, job, or work, and the, the Greek term ergon is actually related to the English word work. They go back to the single, same Indo-European root, which I think says something about how important this concept is to us. According to the final argument of Republic Book One, which we didn't have time to talk about yesterday and won't talk about today, um, a thing has a function if there's something you can do best with it or do only by using it. And for both Plato and Aristotle, in somewhat different ways, there is such a function belonging to the human soul. If the, if the term function sounds unpleasant and instrumentalizing to you, think of it this way. There's a job, a characteristic work that belongs to us as human beings. And that work is to make the most of our given talents and propensities. And what makes a metier, such as a craft, some person's job, is that it's a way for them to do this human job. It's an appropriate vehicle for the human function. 
In a paper on Aristotle's famous function argument, I've argued that this is what he thinks, or anyway um, should think, is committed to thinking by other parts of his theory. It comes out at a crucial moment of Aristotle's function argument when he poses what I think is probably the most frustrating rhetorical question in the history of philosophy. Uh, it goes like this. Have the carpenter then and the shoemaker certain functions or activities and the human being none? Is he by nature idle? So is the human being functionless, idle? It's literally unemployed, but it's ergon. It's not having an ergon. And of course, the answer is supposed to be no. And on my reading, Aristotle's point in invoking the carpenter and the shoemaker here isn't merely analogical. So it's not just an analogical argument. It's a kind of, um, now that I think of it, Corscardian argument. Uh, Aristotle is noting that we take it as obvious that the craft functions of the carpenter and shoemaker really are binding on them. The craft norms go through for those people. And how could that be? How could the duties of craft go through unless the human being doing the shoemaking has a more basic human function, which is being realized through that craft? Which in Korsgaard, so that in Korsgaard's phrase, um, our human identity is standing behind and uh, endowing its normativity to the craft function for the practitioner. So if this is on the right track, then the normativity of craft for the practitioner comes at least in part from the normativity of human nature itself. Now, sort of tracking back to um, locate this in the broader account of craft I've been developing, um, this value of craft as self-realizing uh, for the practitioner combines easily, I think, with the platonic account of craft that I discussed yesterday on which the end of a craft must be a contribution to the common good. So a real craft turns out to be valuable for two different kinds of reasons. I call this the double value account. Uh, a craft has value by producing some distinctive disinterested benefit, that's what we talked about yesterday, and thereby contributing to the common good. And a craft has value by affording opportunities for self-realization on the part of the people who practice it. And as you can see, uh, there's a question that that raises, which is, uh, is this uh, B side of the double value account uh, criterial the way the A side is? So I said yesterday that um, for, the, uh, um, for something to count as a craft, it's a necessary condition uh, that it um, contribute to the common good. Uh, and um, so the question is, uh, does the same thing apply on the other side? Must a craft account as such uh, be such as to enable the self-realization of its practitioners? Now, you might think that the, um, sorry, I'm gonna, uh, I skipped over something, carried away by the excitement of having a slide uh, that people could engage with. Um, so let me go back and uh, say something about the status of, of this account. Um, so this double value account is the core of what I'm going to call the best case scenario for the practice of a craft. Um, so I'm now, I'm edging us towards utopia, which is the concept I wanna talk about in the final section of the paper. And this is kind of the basic building block um, of my conception of utopia, is craft as practiced on the best case scenario. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that we here have, I think, uh, the best sustaining motivation for an ongoing commitment to the practice of a craft. Um, the shoemaker is going to be uh, reliable and committed and practice her craft with integrity when her commitment to doing so is based on recognition of one of these kinds of value uh, or the other or ideally both. So this is the answer to the follow-up question. It's when such a recognition is present that someone's identification with their metier will be best informed, best valued, best guided, excuse me, by the value that's really there and therefore the most stable and friction-free. Um, for a full specification of the best case scenario, I think we also need to add in the course guardian constraints that I've already noted of free adoption and reflective endorsement. Um, so if you don't want to be practicing the craft, none of this is, is going to get you any further. We also have to add in uh, conditions to exclude oppressive work, and I think that's a separate matter. So one interesting thing about the Burton clip is, of course, uh, his father was obviously, in some sense, an oppressed person, and members of his family died um, from coal mining, and all the beauty of craft and so on doesn't really touch that. That's a separate uh, network, I think, of ethical considerations. 
Um, so is the case of the great coal miner shows or the enslaved person who works as a metier, as many did in ancient Greece and Rome. And I can't resist saying that the uh, contemporary example that occurs to me is the California state firefighter, uh, the prisoner who um, fights fires uh, while um, an inmate of uh, the California state prison system. Uh, oppression and the practice of a craft don't exclude each other. And nor do the rewards of practicing the craft magically cancel the oppression out. So in talking about the best case scenario, I also want to stipulate that there's a non-oppression condition that's being met, even though I don't have time to figure out how to best articulate that. So returning now to this question of what we should say in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, should we say that practices which don't afford opportunities for self-realization uh, on the part of the practitioner, that those aren't real crafts. Is this criterial, should we be using it to exclude um, certain ways of making a living from the category? Well, here's the case that I think about when I think about that question. This is the case of Stevens the butler in Kazuo Ishiguro's novel, Remains of the Day. So I should have a picture of Anthony Hopkins here, probably, but too distracting. Uh, we're just going to talk about the novel. Um, and in, it's interesting, in preparing for these talks, I asked people um, for examples of great works of literature featuring craftspeople, and I got surprisingly few. Um, Cormac McCarthy is kind of obsessed with craft. Um, if I had a third session, we would talk about that. Um, but there are fewer portraits than you would think in fiction of uh, the deeply committed craftsperson. And I sort of realized to my horror eventually that actually Stevens the butler was uh, the figure that I was looking for, realized it with horror because if you know the novel, um, it's, a, it's a tragic portrait and uh, a very strange case of a craft if it is one. So that's what I now want to discuss. I think it's the interesting test case um, for the issue here. So Stevens is actually an exemplar of craft as I've been discussing it in these talks. The central theme of his whole discourse to the reader, which takes about just about the whole of the novel, is his absolute dedication to his metier as butler. Although he calls it his profession or his vocation, I don't think anything hangs on the nuance there. We're shown in careful detail that he's a master of his craft and a committed member of the guild. Nor is he morally obtuse. He's not a figure that you can condescend to. Um, he has a broader ethical perspective and makes a point of telling us, um, somewhat implausibly, that it was a mark of his generation to consider the moral status of the masters they served, and that he himself chose his master carefully, with the aim of making his own small contribution to the common good. With all this detail, Ishiguro builds up a convincing portrait of Stephen's ethical world, a slightly hallucinatory alternative reality in which it's simply obvious, known to everyone, that being a butler is a highly noble, unestimable art. And I have to point out, uh, Stevens earns our respect, as, as does Ishiguro, for he manages the whole book on this theme without ever using the word butling or having to use the verb. It's all about the craft of the butler, but all the verbs are very undignified that go with that, right? And never wants to see fall into them. And um, that's not accidental because Stevens is obsessed with the question of what makes for greatness in a butler, and his answer to that question is dignity. Uh, this is the defining feature, perhaps surprisingly, of the great butler, is uh, his dignity in all situations. He identifies this dignity with the great butler's ability to fully inhabit the role, as he puts it, with no distraction or interference by personal considerations or his private life. Now that should ring a kind of bell from last time, because it's a version of what I was calling motivational insulation. And I said it was in essential to integrity in the practice of a craft. Um, so I should be on Team Stevens here. He carries that inhabiting the role, in his own case, to a point of perfection in which all personal considerations are suppressed, and his narrative culminates in a moment of terrible triumph when he feels himself to have met this highest of demands. He doesn't quite say it, but it's clear that he is a great butler by that standard. But his telling of the story also brings to the surface his own latent awareness that something has gone terribly wrong here, and that his way of life has been completely misguided. So the reason I'm going into all this detail about this story is in part because it is a kind of challenge to the account I've been giving. On the story of craft normativity, as I've been telling it, Stevens is an exemplary figure. And yet he's also a comic and deeply tragic figure too. And the question is, what is his tragic uh, mistake? It seems to have something to do, I think, with servility. 
with his having found self-realization, or what he thought was self-realization, in a kind of self-instrumentalization and self-suppression. In fact, he has, with great determination and intelligence, turned himself into an Aristotelian slave, an organon, purely a tool. Something like what, if you know Ishiguro's book, uh, Never Let Me Go, what the characters in that are, are born to be, destined to be, Stevens turns himself into by um, great uh, heroic effort. And I think the point is that that can't be self-realization. But Ishiguro is an incredibly subtle and ambiguous writer and likes to undermine every conclusion of that kind that you reach. And so he leaves us with a puzzle about exactly where Stevens went wrong. There are hints that he may have misunderstood what dignity really is. That's, of course, a very interesting philosophical question. Or perhaps we should think that whatever dignity is, there's got to be more to greatness uh, in any craft than that. It may also be, and this is what I want to focus on as relevant to um, the bottom right of the slide, may also be that he was wrong to think that being a craft could, being a butler, excuse me, could be a craft in the first place. So we get caught out because I think we have a sort of reflex of classism reading this thinking, come on, greatness is a butler, uh, this is a vocation or something, and then you catch yourself out and think, oh, no, I'm being classist. But then in the end, actually, maybe that first reaction had something valid to it. That is, perhaps Stevens is an example of the kind of case I spoke of last time, of someone who tries to make a craft out of some activity that can't actually be one, some activity that isn't apt for the attitudes that make up the um, formation of the craft practitioner. There's a weird convergence here with Plato, for Plato too seems to think that there can be no servile crafts. The end of the butler's job is giving satisfaction to his master, in a telling phrase. Well, in the Gorgias, Plato disqualifies it being pseudo-crafts, mere knacks or flattery, uh, any art which merely aims at the gratification of another person. That includes the pseudo-craft of the rhetorician. And this is a bit paradoxical because um, the rhetorician thinks that his specialty is fine and powerful, and it can, in fact, give him political power. But power is not a genuine good on Plato's account, and rhetoric isn't a genuine art. And Plato would be very happy, I think, with the result uh, of saying that the rhetorician, the orator who gains power over a city, is actually in no better a condition than Stevens the butler. So if this reading is on the right track, then it seems to me that Stevens represents an argument for indeed, for, for taking the question mark out there uh, and saying that indeed, the self-realization side of the double value account is criterial. If some practice can't afford even the most dedicated and intelligent practitioner a path for genuine self-realization, then it isn't a real craft. And I take that to be a welcome addition to the platonic account. I now want to return to the best case scenario and talk about its relevance to work. And I feel very daring doing this because uh, work seems to be something that philosophers mostly don't talk about. We shy away from it. And uh, it is actually very hard um, to find a way into talking about it uh, in a philosophical way. So I'm going to make a kind of primitive stab at that here. You're going to see just how primitive um, in my next slide. Uh, next two slides, excuse me. So section four, the utopia of work. Craft as practiced on the best case scenario seems to me the best conceptual proxy we have for the normative form of work. That's normative in, again, the third sense of meeting a standard. So I mean the standard of what it's rational for us to want in the way of work. I don't think we're ever going to have a consensus on what uh, it means for work to be meaningful, satisfying, worthwhile, unalienated, whatever standard you prefer. And of course, there isn't even any consensus on exactly how to frame uh, the relevant standard. But wherever exactly we want to put the aspirational bar, craft as metier on the best case scenario, so factoring in those course guardian uh, constraints, is going to be well above it. This is the kind of work which it's rational to want for yourself, your children, and your neighbors. And the enormous diversity of big craft means that there should be something in it for everybody. There's nothing constraining about it. Um, no reason to think it's going to be too constraining if we center it when we're thinking about the kind of work that we want to promote individually as a, and as a society. Another way to put this point would be to say that any utopia would have to be built around big craft, though that immediately calls for qualification. For one thing, utopias come in two very different flavors. So that's one of them. Um, and obviously, that's not the one I'm referring to, right? Uh, this is Bruegel's uh, painting of the land of cocaine, 
uh, also known as cloud cuckoo land, uh, where work is only a distant memory and sausages grow on trees. Actually, there's a, a pig in the back carrying a knife to help you um, take slices <laughs> off it. So call that the utopia of ease, that model. The utopia of ease is not a place that interests me very much, since it seems obviously compensatory in its appeal. That is, it gets its appeal from our experience of the opposite, of overwork and scarcity. It's a vision of happy hour, not the happy life. That's why it almost always ends up comic and hyperbolic, and with its residents seeming a bit in or subhuman, completely uh, inert. And by the way, I take utopia of ease to include the statesman myth uh, that Rachna talked about last time, um, of human life in the age of Kronos. I don't think that for Plato that's a genuinely normative vision. So I'm thinking of the other kind of utopia here, which we might indeed call the utopia of work a non-fantastical, genuinely normative society, which is happy in large part because it gets work right. Thomas More's original utopia is a utopia of work, so of course is Plato's Republic. For Plato, the justice of the just city, the foundational virtue of the happy society, consists precisely in the performance of each job by the person naturally suited to it. Now, More and Plato together might give the impression that utopias of work are inherently authoritarian in tendency, and that would be a serious worry. But that's by no means an essential feature. So here as a corrective is an image of what's probably the first utopia of work which most of us here ever encountered. <laughs> so here's an important question which most moral and political philosophers today don't seem to address very often. <laughs> what do people do all day? <laughs> And fortunately, we have other resources uh, for answering this question, including the work of the great Richard Scarry. And he explores this question through Busy Town. Welcome to Busy Town. Busy Town, as you can see, is a very happy place. And what makes it happy is that everyone works. Most of its residents work at crafts, farmer, grocer, captain, cop, and they're identified by their craft generic as well as their name. And note that the um, work which is valued here is not restricted to paid labor. Um, mothers are also among the heroes of busy town. And uh, children, too, work as, uh, in a small way as their assistants. So one question that any utopia of work has to address, actually, is where to place the dividing line between paid and unpaid labor and um, what kind of compensation is appropriate for each. And I'm not going to say anything about that, but I'm, I'm well aware that this is a feminist issue. And I'm not trying to claim that crafts as paid metiers are the only worthwhile kind of work there is. Um, so my language of utopia being built around craft is meant to be much weaker than that. There are no pseudo crafts in busy town and no bullshit jobs either. Their practitioners have each identified with and internalized their craft norms they endorse their practical identities, and so far as one can tell with a cartoon rabbit, they find fulfillment and self-realization in what they do. They further enjoy the relations of fraternity and solidarity generated by the reciprocal exchange of the benefits they produce and the chain of pleasures which that sets off. More than anything else, it's this, the pleasure of being rightly appreciated and valued by one's neighbors, which holds busy town together and makes it a happy place. In fact, this production of social solidarity is important for all utopias of work. Even Plato emphasizes that guardians and producers are going to see each other as friends in the just society, and each is going to be grateful for the contribution made by the other to the whole. So I'm going to propose, actually, that we should see this as a third major kind of value produced by the exercise of craft. Call it the effective or social value, the benefit that craft produces in creating social bonds between practitioner and beneficiary. Uh, which often expand to bring in further groups and knit society together. So this is now a triple value account um, because we're adding C, craft has value by affording shared pleasure, reciprocal esteem, and social solidarity between craftsperson and beneficiary. And note that that's dependent on A, right? Um, it's because what's being produced by the craft is a benefit um, that uh, the pleasure and reciprocity and solidarity ensue. I want to briefly add to this picture one more utopia of work. Um, Richard Scarry doesn't say it all, comes close, uh, but uh, I do want to add a reference to William Morris's News from Nowhere, although we won't have time, uh, much time to discuss it. So that's, that's courtesy of the um, Canadian William Morris Society, uh, which is uh, an ongoing thing. I think it's important to mention Morris in part because his vision of utopia is deeply anti-Platonic. 
It's anarchic, hedonistic, class-free. And so it shows that utopias of work can be radically diverse from each other. For Plato, each of us has a single determinate function by nature, an innate set of capacities in respect of which human beings differ profoundly from each other and thereby are suited to different work. Now, Morris, of course, was the great 19th century advocate for the deep value and importance of the handicrafts, and he was a great practitioner himself of several crafts. And I take it that's why he isn't taken more seriously as a political philosopher as well. He also made wallpaper. How can you, how can you take his theories seriously? Um, so we, we sort of enforce a kind of Platonism uh, in our intellectual lives, where if you're the philosopher, you're not allowed to uh, also do crafts. Um, but I think that's uh, actually a terrible mistake. And ironically, Morris's utopia, which is a, a post-revolutionary future London, is a world in which craft identities have practically disappeared because they'll no longer be practiced as professions or metiers. For what fulfills our nature, according to Morris, is mostly pretty similar from one person to the next. And variety itself is an important part of the human good. Human beings like doing many things, he thinks, and most of us can be adequately good at most of them. So instead of fixed professional roles, Morris's London works by a kind of kaleidoscope of volunteerism, in which people do now this, now that, with varying degrees of skill. And in summer, everyone looks forward to collective haymaking trips, with an enthusiasm which I have to say I did not find entirely convincing. <laughs> but the point is a serious one. Uh, what Morris most wants to get across to us is the idea that all the work really worth doing in a society is, or should be, and can be made pleasant and that in a just society, this pleasure would be the main and perfectly adequate motivation for doing it. What Morris and Plato share then with each other and with every utopia of work is an extremely abstract template. It's a template which, when a theory of human nature is fed into it, can specify what the triple value of craft fully realized would look like, the very best version of the best case scenario, instantiated by a whole society. To note a crucial problem, this template includes a central assumption shared by Morris and Plato, namely that the array of crafts which produce the human good for the community is going to be just the same as the array of crafts which provide self-realization for the people doing them. So A and B in the double account are going to mesh perfectly. There's not going to be any practice which only gives you the one but not the other. Morris believes in this Leibnizian harmonization of craft because he believes in a principle we might call Ruskin's law, that the aesthetic quality of the product expresses the moral quality of the process that produced it. Workers allowed to have autonomy and dignity in an uncorrupted society at one with nature will, if left to their own devices, practice all and only the real crafts at their best, producing useful and beautiful things. Wage slaves in urban hells, conversely, can produce only ugly junk that serves no real need. Take care of working conditions and worker freedom, then, and the crafts needed for utopia will evolve harmoniously on their own into an array which both provides the common good and fulfills their practitioners. Well, unfortunately, I personally don't believe that Ruskin's law is true. We can't have any certainty that the array of crafts which would meet one of the utopian conditions would be adequate for the other. And that places a question mark over the whole project of a utopia of work. But it seems to me we can get a hell of a lot closer to meeting both conditions before any divergence between them would start to become a practical problem. To aim at a utopia of work would simply be to aim for the kind of society in which the crafts flourish and the three kinds of value they produce do coincide. And in fact, this coinciding happens every day already, locally and on a piecemeal basis. Whenever the self-realizing craftsperson taking pride in the elegant exercise of their metier creates a genuine good for the beneficiary the person who's happy to watch, they complete a little circuit of pleasure that amounts for that moment to a utopia for two. Morris himself felt sure that for anything more, a revolution would be required. But that's a story for another day. If all this is on the right track, then craft is still useful to philosophy in some of the ways it was in the ancient world, as a paradigm, a target, a way of bringing into focus some of our most demanding ethical and practical ideals. We can figure out what our own utopia of work would look like by thinking about the area of crafts that it would feature and how our own aspirations to self-realization would fit into them. We can try to nudge our societies in the right direction by working to detect and delegitimize pseudo-crafts and by strengthening the institutions which support the real ones. And we can think about how to widen the spaces in which the little utopias happen until they might extend to the whole shape and size of a society. 
Craft is, as ever, under threat. But many people do still find in the exercise of a craft a kind of solace and refuge, a local restoration of their sense of agency. And I hope that trying to think through some of the philosophical puzzles and opportunities craft presents can have some of the same effect. In any case, c'est mon métier. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for a, another wonderful lecture. I think let's let's take a five minute break uh, before reconvening for questions. So we'll uh, be back here at um, five twenty two. Okay, welcome back. Let's settle down. I'm I'm just delighted to see how many people are here and here after the break. Even uh, this. Um, it's just really heartening. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first commentator today, who's uh, Christine Korsgaard, uh, the Arthur Kingsley Porter Research Professor of, of Philosophy at Harvard University. Uh, there she is. Chris is an absolutely towering figure within contemporary philosophy, the author of exceptionally influential contributions on Kant, the foundations of ethics, and the study of normativity. Indeed, she's arguably responsible virtual, virtually single-handedly for making the topic of normativity the salient focus of philosophical study that it has now become. It was her book, The Sources of Normativity, published in 1996, that many of us regard as the modern Ur text for reflections about this concept. And its appearance led to an explosion of books, articles, and conference, conferences devoted to the specific theme. Chris develops a view that the requirements that are binding on an agent reflect commitments that are constitutive of the agent's point of view, an idea with obvious Kantian inspiration, but also one that is anticipated in some of the great works of the ancient tradition and that Rachel makes effective use of in today's lecture on the normativity of craft. Chris has pursued this theme in several of her subsequent publications, including the essays collected in The Constitution of Agency, and the book Self-Constitution from 2009. Another extremely important stream in Chris's research is her engagement with the theme of the moral standing of animals. She's been concerned throughout her career to show that the broadly Kantian approach to ethics that she favors can do justice to the moral significance of animals who matter in their own right, not merely because our treatment of them potentially affects our own character and capacities. Her penetrating reflections on this theme are impressively developed in her latest book, Fellow Creatures, Our Obligations to the Other Animals, which is the most interesting and original treatment of the moral standing of animals that I've read. Chris's many honors and distinctions are too numerous to catalog here, but I would uh, note that she's one of the few figures to have delivered Tanner lectures on two different continents, uh, the first of which in Cambridge in 1992 were the basis of uh, the sources of normativity. Her Locke lectures in Oxford were the basis of self-constitution, and her um, Uhiro lectures also delivered in Oxford eventually gave rise to fellow creatures. She's also held a Mellon Distinguished Achievement Award in the humanities. Chris is well known to us at Berkeley. Her books figure regularly in our courses. There are many students in attendance today who've recently read both sources and fellow creatures in classes taught by me. And she has visited us on many occasions, most recently as Howison Lecturer in Philosophy in 2016. We were very sorry to learn that an illness has prevented Chris from coming to Berkeley this week, as she very much had hoped to do herself. But we're delighted that she's able to join us for these events via Zoom. Please join me in welcoming Chris Korsgaard. <laughs> Okay, I would like to begin, um, first of all, by thanking Jay, and also by thanking all of you who scrambled to find a way to get here, me here by Zoom when it turned out that I couldn't come. I wanted very much to be here, and I'm very grateful to you. Now, the first thing I'm going to say today was not planned, so Rachel hasn't been warned of this one, but I have been struck so far in the conference by how little anyone has said about what I regard as one of the greatest expressions of craft in modern times. I mean the movies. 
just think of the number of different crafts that are involved in the production of a movie. Acting, screenwriting, music, scenery and lighting, stunt work, and many others, all coordinated by a director who by bringing them together sometimes manages to create a great work of art. And even when the director doesn't create a great work of art, he often manages to create something that nearly everyone, even in our fractured society, kind of likes. Although Ranchana might say that sort of director only has a knack. Anyway, I would have thought the director using all of these crafts to create his two hours of an imaginary world is a rather good model for the platonic guardians who coordinate the crafts in the Republic to create a good world. So I just thought I'd throw that in. Now, in the rest of today's comments, I'm going to talk rather shamelessly about some of the ways in which Rachel's ideas intersect with my own. And my excuse for that is that I think some of the ideas I've been working on lend her ideas additional support. So these comments will mostly be uh, positive and friendly. Now, Rachel believes, correctly, I think, that the adoption of a craft is the adoption of what I would call a form of practical identity. It's a form of normative identity, which makes us subject to the reasons and obligations that spring from it. In a recent unpublished paper on the human good, I argue that the human good has two parts. I understand the good in an Aristotelian way, just as I think Rachel does, as the good performance of our function. Like the other animals, we have a natural identity, which gives us a natural good. That consists in having the kinds of things that enable us to function well as human animals, food, water, physical and mental exercise, sleep, social relations, and so on. But because we human beings are rational, we can evaluate the reasons on which we act as good or bad. And because we identify ourselves as the sources of our actions, we value ourselves positively when we think that we do good things for good reasons. This means that we have a practical identity, which as Rachel told you, I described in uh, sources as a description under which you value yourself and find your life worth living and your actions worth undertaking. The need to construct and function well in your practical identity is the need to make something worthwhile of yourself. So valuing ourselves is an essential part of the human good. And that fact that we have a need to make something of ourselves is also how Rachel describes the things that makes it worthwhile for us to adopt a craft identity. So the human good is, a, is a, to have function well in both parts of our identity. But those two things, your natural good and the good of functioning well in your practical identity stand in an uneasy relation because your practical identity can make demands upon you which are in tension with your natural good. Under certain circumstances, your practical identity can subject you to demands for very hard labor, physical danger, social isolation, and so on. One of the difficult things about being human is that we have to decide how to negotiate these conflicts within our, within our good when they occur. A good society will reduce the occasion for conflicts between our natural and practical identities. In the case of craft identities, or at least professional ones, this will include creating working conditions that make it possible to satisfy our natural needs while doing our work. And I take this to be an essential part of uh, Rachel's idea of a utopia of work. Now, that is ultimately uh, Rachel's answer to the question why you should adopt the identity of a craftsperson. But Rachel takes it to be a somewhat different question, why a craft is normative for a craftsperson. She offers us what she calls a very simple answer. She says, and I'm quoting here, anyone engaged in the practice of shoemaking ought to try to make good shoes, not because it's their profession or metier or social role or their practical identity, but simply because it's the thing that they're doing. That thing is a craft and craft norms apply. Now, Rachel says this is because, and I'm quoting again, there's arguably a still more basic point underlying agents, underlying point about agency here. In most contexts, trying to X 
uh, trying to fly is just trying to fly correctly. And there seems to be a slippery slope between making a shoe well, making it not so well, making it badly, and not having succeeded in making a shoe at all. Now, I believe, as Rachel suggests, that there is a basic point about the nature of agency at work here. And this is what I'm going to be focusing on. I think that Rachel, what Rachel says uh, is supported by the theory of agency that I discussed primarily in my book, Self-Constitution. Now, the central idea of that theory of agency is the idea of a constitutive standard. In its simplest form, a constitutive standard is a normative standard that applies to something, some object or some action or activity by virtue of the thing's own nature. And in most cases, that means by virtue of its function, because of what it's for. In a slightly stronger sense, a constitutive standard constitutes the thing as the kind of thing that it is, so that if it didn't meet the standard, at least to some extent, it would not be that kind of thing at all. To take some very simple examples, it's a constitutive standard for knives that they should be sharp because their function is cutting. It's a constitutive standard for encyclopedias that they should be accurate because their function is to inform. And it's a constitutive standard for houses. That they should provide shelter for their owners and their owner's property. These objects must meet their constitutive standards in order to be what they are, at least to some extent. And they're good of their kind to the extent that they meet those standards. Now, constitutive standards also apply to activities. In self-constitution, I call these things constitutive principles because they're standards which we deliberately follow, and also because, as I will explain tomorrow, the principles of practical reason are among them. They're the constitutive standards of rational activity. The principles of agency are constitutive in a further sense. We constitute ourselves as the agents of those activities by following the standards. Consider first teleological activities, which are aimed at producing some object or condition that exists independently of the activity itself. Crafts, as Rachel points out to us, are often teleological in that sense. They produce objects. A teleological activity can also produce a condition which exists independently of it. The doctor produces health in the patient. And in some cases, the independence of the result from the activity of producing it is less clear. Acting, and now I mean in the sense of acting on stage and screen, not in the fundamental sense of deploying your powers of agency. Acting produces the presentation of a character, but the presentation happens in the acting and is not an external result of it. Nevertheless, acting is arguably teleological and so craft. The representation of the character is the result of what the actor does. Now, where an activity is teleological, the constitutive principles of the activity are derived from the constitutive standards of the object produced. The builder who is building a house is guided by the aim of producing a structure that will successfully shelter. The cook is guided in his cooking by the aim of producing nutritious food that will be good to eat. And the actor, maybe I should call him the thespian to avoid conclusion, confusion, is guided in his acting by the aim of showing us a character of the kind he thinks the role requires. It follows from this the constitutive principles of, say, building a house and the constitutive principles of building a good house are the same. That is, it follows that these are not two different activities. I find it easiest to make this point vivid in Aristotelian terms. Aristotle believed that every substance, everything, has a form and a matter. The matter is the parts, the material, the stuff of which the thing is made. The form of the thing is the way it's put together, where that is understood as being what explains how the thing is able to serve the function that it does. For example, it's the way the parts of a house are put together that enable it to serve the function of providing shelter. To see this, suppose you're building a house. Let's say that the parts are walls, roof, windows, and door. 
When you're building the house, what you do is put those parts together in a way that will enable the resulting structure to serve the function of sheltering. And so by realizing the form of a house, you put the walls together at the corner to make the structure weatherproof and tight. You put windows into the walls to let in air and light. You put roof over the top to keep the rain and snow out. And you insert the door into one of the walls so that people can go in and out. This shows us two things. First, the activity of house building is given by the form of a house. Aristotle says the form is what the builder knows. And second, since a house that realizes its form is a good house, the activity of building a house is exactly the same activity as the activity of building a good house. Or to put it a different way, trying to build a house is exactly the same activity as trying to build a good house. If you do it badly, you have not engaged in a different activity. You have simply bungled it. If you're not trying to put those parts together in a way that will enable the house to serve the function of sheltering, as a good house does, you're simply not building a house. So if this theory of agency is true, Rachel is right. Her simple answer is right. Trying to make shoes and trying to make good shoes is exactly the same thing. It's the same activity. Anyone who's trying to make shoes is trying to make good shoes. And the reason you should try to make good shoes is simply that you're trying to make shoes. And that's all there is to it. But if this account of activity is true, what are we to say about the dishonest builder who uses substandard materials in which to realize the form or puts them together in a way that falls short of serving the function? some way that's faster or can be done with cheaper labor, say. What should we say about the nature of his activity? Isn't he still building a house? Now, I think we should say pretty much exactly what Plato did say when confronted with this kind of case in the first book of the Republic, which is that insofar as he's doing that, he's not a builder at all, but a moneymaker. As I put it in self-constitution, he's not trying to build a house. He's trying to make money by building a cheap imitation of the house, one that he can pass off on an unwary customer. Now, I know this sounds to many people as if it couldn't possibly be an important metaphysical thesis about the nature of action or activity. All that I've done here is redescribe the activity by redescribing its end. And that's a move which simply as a matter of language is available at least in the case of teleological activities. But, people say, it surely doesn't show that doing something well, doing something and doing it well are really the same activity. Now, there are several things to say in response to this. One is that although the Aristotelian account of the nature of teleological activity is helpful to me here, it's not the absolutely necessary to making the point. Here's another way it's been done. In a symposium on pretending, J.L. Austin gave us an example that goes like this. A burglar is posing as a window washer in order to get a chance to case the building he plans to rob. Obviously, the easiest and most effective way to pretend to wash a window is to wash the window. So we may imagine he's going through the very same motions with soapy water and a brush or a squeegee that he would go through as if he, that if he were washing the window. The question is, what's he doing here? What's his activity? Is he casing the joint or is he washing the window or both? Austin says what he's doing is primarily casing the joint because he's only cleaning the window to disguise that activity. Now, one way to understand that is by appeal to the criterion of success for the activity. The burglar is casing the joint because he has succeeded when he knows what he needs to know about the building in order to burgle it successfully. In the same way, my dishonest builder has succeeded at what he's trying to do as soon as he produces something that will fetch the price of a house. So that's what he's doing. He's trying to build something that'll fetch the price of a house. He's not trying to build a house. Okay, my purpose today has just been to argue that two of Rachel's points are correct. First, the reason for adopting the identity of a craftsperson is that it's a form of practical identity, 
and the good for human beings rests in having and successfully enacting such an identity. If the good for a human being also rests in functioning well as a human animal, then Rachel is also right that the government needs to create a utopia of work in which these two aspects of the good are made to go together. Second, I've tried to support Rachel's claim that the reason why a craftsperson should act in accordance with the norms of her craft is simply that she's practicing the craft by appeal to a theory of agency and activity. According to this theory, doing something and doing it well, or at least trying to do it and trying to do it well, are the same activity. And that means that if you think of yourself as a shoemaker and you make bad shoes, you have bungled the job. If that's right, then Rachel is right that the reason why a shoemaker should make good shoes is simply that she's making shoes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, I'm delighted now to be able to introduce our second commentator today, uh, Alexander Nehamas. Um, Alexander is the uh, Edmund N. Carpenter, the second class of 1943 professor in the humanities at uh, Princeton University, where he has taught since 1990. He's the kind of philosopher whose breadth of interests make him impossible to categorize in the narrow parameters that have come to dominate our increasingly and lamentably professionalized field. He's made important contributions to the study of ancient philosophy, but also to aesthetics uh, and to the study of Nietzsche, for instance. But merely to list these different areas of achievement is to miss the brilliant way in which Alexander's reflections on each of these topics um, are deeply informed by his engagement with the others and indeed with further topics as well. Philosophy for Alexander is not so much a scholarly discipline as a way of living and engaging with the world. And Alexander has taught us vividly that materials for significant philosophical reflection can be found virtually anywhere, on television, for instance, as much as in the stacks of the library. Like Chris, Alexander has himself delivered the Tanner Lectures on Human Values, in his case at Yale University. And also like Chris, he's been the recipient of the Mellon Distinguished Achievement Award in the humanities, one of a very small handful of recipients of this war, uh, award in the field. He also, like uh, Chris, has deep connections to our own university. He was Sather Professor in what was then called the Department of Classics in 1992 to 93. And his lectures in that role eventually appeared as The Art of Living, Socratic Reflections from Plato to Foucault. A later visit to Berkeley as the Townsend visitor in the Department of Philosophy resulted in a further rich volume, only a promise of happiness, the place of beauty in a world of art. His pathbreaking Nietzsche, Life as Literature, appeared in uh, 1985. I'm a particular fan of Alexander's most recent book on friendship from 2016, which is a penetrating set of reflections on the nature and distinctive value of this form of relationship, which Alexander sees in aesthetic terms as a locus of open-ended meaning and a mechanism of individuality, one more faithfully depicted in serial detective novels than in the great works of pictorial art in the Western tradition. The two personal examples of friendship that structure Alexander's discussion in this rich book are the person who cuts Alexander's hair or who cut his hair at the time, I don't know. Still, okay, <laughs> I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, and our own Berkeley colleague, Tom LeCur, an intellectual companion of Alexander's from college days, who is, um, who's here with us today, and um, who Tom, uh, uh, and whom Alexander speaks with, I think, virtually every day. Uh, I too have enjoyed the benefit of a kind of minor friendship with Alexander, closer to Tomas than to Tom, that traces back to a, a brief period when we were colleagues in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, where he functioned for me, I was a very, uh, st just starting out back then, he functioned for me as something of a moral compass and also as an impossible ideal of academic aspiration. He's disturbed to hear the moral compass bit. <laughs> he doesn't really like moralizing, but you know, despite his best efforts, he was kind of a, a, a good 
moral compass. Anyway, we're delighted to have Alexander back in Berkeley today for these events. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very aware that I'm the last one here. You're probably exhausted, though you should also be very happy to have heard what you've heard so far. Um, uh, let me just go on, you know, instead of <laughs> apologizing. So Rachel Barney is right. Uh, philosophy is her métier. In fact, oratory seems to be her métier as well, uh, as I realized last two days. Uh, a métier, she tells us, is a skilled job <clears throat> which, like crafts, like craft, travels with a person. It's a job which is your job in virtue of what you know how to do. So philosophy is what Rachel does. All this is italicized does. An important part of what she is, italicized is. And as the last two days have demonstrated, something that as Heine expected of God, and I'll come back to the word expect, uh, she does well italicized. <laughs> philosophy is her métier and her practical identity, or one of them. For her, the thought of Plato and Aristotle is a living body from which there is much to learn. And philosophy's past is crucial to its present. Her work is brave, and I say brave, I thought about that. It's brave to take on Plato on one of the most controversial issues that he actually dealt with and present him in the way that she has presented him to us in, the, in these lectures. It's brave, it's thoughtful, and inspiring. Her commitment to the ancients is not merely intellectual, but like her understanding of craft itself, affective as well. She reads them with rigor, but also, I dare say, with love, and an uncompromising commitment to the vision of craft, virtue, and society. This is the history of philosophy at its best. She does not, like many of us, think that we honor the figures of the past if we happen to find in them views that we happen to hold today. She looks instead for views that we don't hold and that we should make our own. Hers is an outstanding instance of our craft. But is philosophy a craft? Mm. She makes it clear that not every craft is a métier. More than a profession of a line of work, a métier is something I identify with as mine, she says. But what of the other direction? Is every métier a craft? In particular, is philosophy a craft? Well, I was amazed to find out that in Plato, in that vast oeuvre of Plato, philosophy and uh, techne are brought together twice, in two passages only, and only in six in Aristotle, three of which are all from very early work of his, the Protepticus. And nine, none of those passages clearly identifies philosophy as a techne. And in fact, and that struck me yesterday morning like a burst of lightning, it can't be. Philosophy can't be a techne for Plato, because if it is, then the philosopher rulers of the Republic would have two jobs which would undermine the whole point of the Republic, which depends on each person doing one job and one job only. Now, I don't know, maybe that's totally wrong. I, it just struck me, as I said, it, 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 I think it has to be right, actually. <laughs> anyway, that would be really a glaring and destruct, a destructive exception to the principle of one, per, one citizen, one job. To be sure, philosophy involves several crafts. Uh, today's philosophy, for example, uh, involves interpreting texts. I say that first because I'm a historian. Uh, constructing and evaluating arguments. Uh, writing journal articles. Uh, all these qualify us as members of a guild. In fact, Richard Rorty once described the PhD as our union card. Uh, but philosophy lacks a well-defined end. The pursuit of truth will not do. Uh, a well-defined end that allows us to evaluate the craft's products without serious controversy. 
it's a difference, I think, we should take into account. And some of what I'm trying to do is to complicate the picture of big craft that uh, Rachel has been giving us, which is, I think, a wonderful, wonderful concept. Not, of course, that agreement was as widespread among the ancients as Plato often implies. Uh, Rachel, in her first lecture, didn't, uh, refers to Hesiod's Oh, no, you didn't, you didn't mention that yesterday. Uh, uh, Potter hates. Potter, uh, com <laughs> computers, no. Carpenters compete. Uh, beggar strives with beggar and bard with bard. Um, the author of the great Hippocratic work on ancient medicine begins the book by heaping invective on his uh, competitors. The painters Zeuxis and uh, Parasius Apelles and Polygnotus constantly fought for who was the greatest painter of the time. And I searched for this. I, I wrote about this somewhere, and I referred to it, but I couldn't find it in anything I, in anything I found. There's a, there's a tombstone of a craftsman of a kind of, a kind of I can't remember what craft it is, but what it basically says is, here lies so-and-so, a great uh, worker in this particular craft, much better than the fellow who's buried <laughs> over there and is really a sham. Uh, one who's bungled the job, so to speak, to use Chris's expression. Um, still, <clears throat> I think we can generally recognize a good show, uh, uh, sorry, shoe, <laughs> when we see or wear it. But what counts as good philosophy is constantly being contested. Um, also, if, if a shoemaker says of another shoemaker, he's not a real or they're not a real shoemaker, what is being contested is the quality of the work. When philosophers say this is not real philosophy, that means something more than that. It's not exactly clear what, but it's more. In that respect, though of course not in all, philosophy is more like art than it is like craft. Rachel includes the arts in big craft, but I think we should think about the differences between them. Um, between art and craft, that is. And these are worth, uh, also serious and worth thinking about. Uh, they're certainly less extreme than the philosopher R.G. Collingwood uh, took them to be. Uh, for him, craft was almost a purely mechanical uh, affair, um, activity. He calls it, he defines it as the power to produce a preconceived result by, by means of consciously controlled and directed action, and its product is preconceived or thought out before being arrived at. Uh, the craftsman, he writes, knows what he wants to make before he makes it. By contrast, he writes, and that's actually a terrifically interesting idea that I'm not going to, unfortunately, have time to talk about, uh, what an artist wants to say is not present to him as an end towards which means have to be devised. It becomes clear to him only as the poem takes shape in his mind. Still, Collingwood actually conceded that I quote again, some works of art are also works of craft, as may be seen by the example of a building or a jar which is made to order for the satisfaction, satisfaction of a specific demand to serve a useful purpose, but may nonetheless be a work of art. So when is a jar a work of art? Well, jars, of course, come in many varieties, but a jar that is a work of art somehow stands out among them. It differs in ways that catch our interest, provoke our admiration, perhaps even inspire our love. Not limited to its function, which any other jar would do, they're perfectly fungible in that respect, our concern extends to the features that make it not a generic product, but an irreplaceable individual that does something that is distinctly its own. It follows the rules that determine what the jar is, or what counts as a jar, but it's also something more. And that something, I think, can't possibly be specified by rules. It's always something beyond what the rules can tell us. One of my great examples of that I should, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, suppose I, I was a painter and I wanted to learn how to make, to do paintings, and I go to my teacher and say, how do I make a great painting? And my teacher, shows me a Rembrandt self-portrait, that's it. Well, what do I do? Of course, I'll have to copy it. But if I copy it and stay there, I've only made an imitation. If I copy it to learn from it, the same way that you know, painters do all the time, and then spend a lot of time copying other works and learning about them, eventually, if 
I have the talent, and if I'm lucky, and if everything works out, and I have the right connections, or whatever it takes to be a successful artist, I might make a great painting. But that great painting necessarily is going to differ from Rembrandt's painting. It has to be different. And yet, in some sense, I've imitated Rembrandt. I've imitated not the painting, but his accomplishment. <laughs> anyway, that was an aside. Ah, sorry. Some crafts involve little or no variation. Mason jars, and I had some slides about that, but I won't, I don't, uh, I'm not going to bother, are all pretty much the same. They differ a little in size and color and a little bit in shape. They're generally equally good at what they do, and who makes them doesn't really matter. Style is more or less irrelevant to mason jars. Other crafts are more flexible. The requirements that shoes must meet, for example, establish a broader, though still, in my opinion, rather narrow range of variation. The material, shape, and color can differ. Their quality can be, is variable, and the makers can matter, which is why they come with names, a Ferragamo, or Nike, or whatever it is, that, uh, that uh, suggest a generic kind of style. In shoemaking, as in craft making more generally, a good shoe, once you figure out how to make it, establishes a pattern that, with the right training, others can make as well. And though they differ in quality more than mason jars, the distance between good shoes and bad is relatively short, certainly shorter than the pain a bad shoe can cause, might make us think. Uh, Rachel writes that the, sh the slope between making a shoe well, making it not so well, making it badly, and not having succeeded in making a shoe at all is slippery. It, I agree, but it's not very long. <laughs> now, however long that slope can be, the variety of shoes pales before the kinds of art and philosophy. The forms philosophy has taken, for example, include, and here I'm using a wonderful list that Arthur Dante once uh, 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 included in, uh, in his presidential address to the Philosophical Association. It includes dialogues, lecture notes, fragments, poems, examinations, essays, aphorisms, meditations, discourses, hymns, critiques, letters, sumai, encyclopedias, testaments, commentaries, investigations, tractatuses, vorlesungen, aufbauen, prolegomena, paraga, pensee, sermons, supplements, confessions, sententiae, inquiries, diaries, outlines, sketches, commonplace books, addresses, and innumerable forms that have no genetic identity or that themselves constitute distinct genres, and he goes on. The views presented now in these forms are even more multifarious. A Wikipedia actually lists 192 schools of philosophy. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 many of them are to be uh, you know, sus <laughs> suspected, but I think there are probably others that they haven't included. But uh, think of the um, tremendous differences between the various schools of philosophy, and then think also of the tremendous differences between the adherents of each school of philosophy. Uh, as to the qualitative differences between them, Think of Plato, Kant, or Wittgenstein on the one hand, and many papers in many philosophy journals. Today. <laughs> or again, think of the distance between any work of Manet and a velvet uh, portrait of Elvis. But more than the huge variety in form and content distinguishes art and philosophy from craft. Craft succeeds when applying the rules, is bound to result at best Sorry, oh, craft succeeds when applying the rules attains a worthwhile result. In the arts and philosophy, by contrast, rule following is bound to result at best in mediocrity, at worst in failure. The point here is to accomplish something new, something others haven't already accomplished, something like Colin Goose jar that goes beyond what is required for being a member of a school or a genre. Craft does not require, though of course it permits and rewards, the effort to introduce new and un unanticipated versions of its products, but a good shoe is usually a version of a known type. If the shoe fits, make it again. But that's exactly what good art and good philosophy never do. They never make it again. Instead, they make something that, going beyond the rules, is both new and fair both unexpected and still recognizably part of philosophy or art. Not to mention 
that the products of craft generally contribute, if not to the common good, it's worth talking about, at least to the good of some social group. On the other hand, it's worth asking, what good are the moonstar shoes that Roberto Vieri makes and that retail for 19 million point, 19 million nine hundred thousand dollars? But is all good art and philosophy always also good for society? And if not, is or are they a good model for virtue and the good society? I will not stay for an answer. <laughs> Though I agree that the shoemaker should try to make good shoes, and one nit I have to pick with Rachel is that she, sometimes you say he should try to make good shoes, and sometimes they should make good shoes. And those are not the same. I'll come back to that. Um, I'm not sure, that, so I agree that the shoemaker should try to make good shoes, but I'm not so sure that's a matter of duty or obligation. Uh, that's why I use the word expected earlier in connection with Heine. It's something that we expect of the shoemaker. It's not quite clear to me that it's strong enough to call it a duty or an obligation, but that's something that I would leave for discussion. Um, in any case, the question is why? Why is it an expectation even? And Rachel answers, I quote, anyone engaged in the practice of shoemaking ought to try to make good shoes, not because of their profession or their métier or social role or their practical identity, but simply because it's a thing they're doing and the thing is a craft and craft norms apply. But social roles that, like mother or friend, which aren't crafts, also involve the same should. And so do art and philosophy. So where does their normativity come from? Uh, what I'm going to say now is a very simple-minded version of what Chris just explained in so clear and vivid detail. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether normativity. I'm not sure I know. But I confess that I am tempted by the minimalist view that Rachel calls the simple answer uh, the basic underlying point about agency. <clears throat> in most contexts, trying to do something is trying to do it well. Trying to make shoes or do philosophy or paint a portrait is trying to make good shoes, do good philosophy, paint a good portrait. Shoemakers don't make two distinct efforts, one to make shoes and one to make good ones, nor do they form two distinct intentions, one to make shoes and another to make good shoes. I'm not even sure that making good shoes is a matter of intention, since it really is much more a matter of ability and of external factors on which we don't have very much control. Uh, though making shoes doesn't mean making good shoes, the word shoes in this context, or making for that matter, uh, has its own normative force. To use Plato's vocabulary, the shoemaker is guided by an understanding of what shoes are by their nature, which specifies their function as they best perform it. That ideal function is what the shoemaker tries to realize in the objects that shoemaking produces. But what counts as a good philosopher or a good artist, a good mother or a good friend, is much, much less determinate. It is manifested in vastly different and often quite conflicting ways, which is why, in contrast to craft, at least as usually understood, we can't specify what it is in terms that are both general and informative. A good shoe fits well, is not too heavy, does not orient our backbone unnaturally, and is not repulsively ugly. Good shoes, insofar as they serve their function well, are like happy families all alike. But every good work of art is good in its own way. Rachel, with Plato, thinks that both the projects of craft, craft and the end they serve must be good, hence the connection between craft and virtue. In yesterday's lecture, she argued that what the craftsperson does has value in the eyes of others, and then she immediately went to identify that with the common good. Something, though, can have value in the eyes of others without contributing to the common good. Alberto's maf mafia bosses would be better off if he does what they want. She counters that Alberto has no obligation to do as he's told. Being a mafioso doesn't impose any obligation because, in view of the, the moral quality of uh, its end, it is merely a pseudocraft. Now, I confess, I've always been bothered by Plato's habit of always taking everything that he doesn't approve of and saying it's not a real thing. Uh, or a craft. The sophists are not real philosophers. Rhetoric is not a real craft. Painting is not a real craft. Just a game. Poetry is not a real craft. By contrast, in this respect, 
Aristotle takes to heart the principle expounded by the author of a, the Hippocratic the medical book on the art, which says where there are procedures which can be right or wrong, uh, Rachel actually uh, mentions that passage in a footnote in the first lecture, a consideration of these must constitute a craft, techni. For my part, I say that there is no craft where there is neither a right way nor a wrong way. The rhetoric and the poetics uh, find and determine that right and wrong, well and badly, apply to both oratory and poetry, and secured by that criterion their status as craft, as techni. <coughs> These works approach craft in a way that is more formalist than Plato's. They agree with Rachel's account up to the point when she identifies the end of a craft with a common good. On a formalist view, a craft is understood in terms of structure and object, independently of the object's value for society as a whole. The only requ requirement is that the craft's end benefit not only the practitioner, but some social group as well. That is true of both Shoemaker and Mafioso. The problem with the Mafioso, in my opinion, is that the gangster's craft is morally unacceptable. If Alberto, who more or less wakes up one day to find himself a Mafioso, feels that his moral commitments are more important than his practical obligation to the Mafia, then perhaps he should direct his efforts to becoming not a Mafioso as quickly as possible. But he was forced into that position. And that, I think, makes a difference. The fact that he's forced, however, into it, and the fact of the price that he would have to pay if he did not do as ordered, generate a dilemma I find very difficult to resolve. What would I do in that position? Well, it's impossible to tell without being in that position. And the most I can say is that I really hope I'll never find myself in it but I would feel very differently if instead of being blackmailed into it, becoming a wise guy like Henry Hill in uh, Scorsese's uh, Goodfellas has always been my childhood dream. And it's not clear to me that there would be no obligations or expectations. The commitment to a craft, Rachel argues, though not clearly moral, is also not unrelated to morality. The good person, she says, who is a good shoemaker will try to make good shoes. It's no less true that a bad person will not necessarily try to make bad shoes. The badness of the bad person need not be manifested in the shoemaking itself. A bad person who is a shoemaker is not on that account a bad shoemaker. History, and in fact, much recent history, is full of the outstanding accomplishments of people who turn out to be very, very bad by our standards. Nature might say, that their badness is necessarily related to the accomplishments, that without the one, they wouldn't do the other. I don't know. Large questions lurk here, and I will not face them now. Nor will I face many, many other large questions that go through Rachel's magnificent lectures, especially her vision of the utopia of work, where everyone, as she puts it so well, does something tethered on the one side to an ideal of flourishing or happiness, which it promises. That's a nice expression. And, the other, and on the other, to an ideal of right action, which it demands. That ideal is shared both by Plato, uh, for whom each individual is naturally suited for one job and one job only, and by William Morris, in whose perfect society, I quote her, people do now this, now that, and look forward to their collective haymaking with enthusiasm, which he doesn't approve, and which, Morris thought, only a revolution could bring about. Exactly so, thought another revolutionary who imagined, I quote, a society where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he likes, he wishes, and makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. Plato, William Morris, and Marx. Thank you, Rachel. Great shoes, by the way. We love your shoes. <laughs> Check them out. <laughs> well, uh, 
Well, thank you very much to uh, Chris Korsgaard and Alexander Damas both. Uh, this is the wonderful thing about the Tanner format is that I get to outsource the hard parts of my argument um, to some of the uh, most distinguished um, possible people to uh, provide them for me. So I'm very happy to have um, uh, Chris Korsgaard affirm that uh, her account of agency and self-constitution meshes nicely with the things that I wanted to say about craft normativity. Um, just two qualms about uh, what she said. First of all, about the movies. Um, she's absolutely right that the movies are one of the great, um, this is probably a bit of junk terminology that won't get us anywhere, but the word I use to myself is multi-craft. So a uh, uh, craft that's the product of many uh, quite different crafts working together. You've got the actor, the editor, the um, production designer, the composer. Um, and these are really quite different from each other and there's a single product that they all collaborate on producing. And it seems to be important for thinking about big craft that in our era, especially actually most crafts are parts of multi-craft. Uh, there's the restaurant and you need the different uh, kinds of chef and waiter and so on. Um, there's the hospital with the doctor and the nurse and the administrator and uh, so forth. There's the university. There's um, it's the, the sort of traditional model of the, the potter sitting alone. Um, actually, that wasn't even true for ancient potters. They worked in workshops with, with a division of labor and a, a single collaborative project. I'm a little uneasy about taking the movies as our kind of sole conceptual model for that, though, because as Chris Gard Corsard points out, um, there is an authority figure with the movies. There is someone analogous to the Aristotelian or Platonic politicos, the director who's imposing their will through all uh, these subcrafts. And I'm not sure that's always the right model to have. I, I wonder about restaurants, actually. Should we think of the restaurant as being like the movie with the chef as director? Or is there a real kind of plurality there with um, no single authority figure and, and um, just different people doing their thing. And I'm influenced here actually by Adam Gopnik's uh, depiction of uh, theater, musical theater in particular, as a kind of multi-craft where uh, really there is no one um, boss in charge. I mean, it sounds horrible. That's, that's part of the point. <laughs> Makes the process a lot more difficult. But some multi-crafts genuinely are like that. And if we were to work towards having a full theory of craft, that's exactly the kind of quasi-metaphysical, but also practical and ethical question that we should be trying to answer is which things are like that and which things aren't. Um, uh, my other qualm about uh, the Course Guardian picture has to, I don't even know if this is a qualm or just a trivial point that I want to reaffirm, but I'm a bit worried about the burglar uh, washing the windows and also the dishonest builder, um, because I do want to reaffirm that even if we um, want to say the builder doesn't really want to build a house, he just wants to convince people that he's um, built a house so as to make money out of it, uh, there is still a sense in which, um, again, if you're doing the activity, you're subject to the norms of the craft. Um, I can't help being reminded of the old joke. It might even be a, a New Yorker cartoon about the actor who is working as a waiter and people complain about the quality of the service. And he says, well, you know, I'm not really a waiter. I'm uh, an actor, come see my play. And, you know, this is, this is supposed to be, you know, no, that's not uh, an adequate um, explanation or response. Um, and we don't in fact let the dishonest builder off the hook. There's a sense in which it is actually very informative and interesting, and uh, I would say also platonic, to pick out what the end of the dishonest builder's activity is. That's an important way of looking uh, at what he's doing, but it still actually is the case that he's building a house and he's subject to craft norms. And I don't think Chris wanted to deny that at all, but um, I wanted to make sure that it was uh, still in view. Um, turning to Alexander's comments just very briefly, I think I'll defer thinking about the relation of art and craft till tomorrow. I think that should be a, a big theme for our, our session on Friday. Um, and I'd also like to defer what I think we should call the Henry Hill problem of whether maybe a bad craft could oblige in um, some odd way, because that seems like an important question too. Uh, is philosophy a craft? Huh. Well, I, I was hoping no one was going to uh, raise that question, um, but here we are. And I think uh, I agree with Alexander that it's not actually. 
Um, and he has a number of good reasons for saying that. It doesn't seem to be rule bound in the right sort of way. There's a huge variety of form and content. And like the artist, the philosopher tries uh, to make something new, to say something that hasn't been said before in a way that isn't um, necessarily uh, true for the shoemaker. So I have a, a pessimistic uh, way of putting the same thought, um, which is uh, to compare to um, I had a friend in high school who went off to do something like the Canadian version of the Peace Corps in uh, extremely rural Zimbabwe. And uh, before she left, she was given a copy of a book called Where There Is No Doctor. And the point of where there is no doctor is it will tell you how to amputate your own limbs and uh, deal with snake venom and basically do what you can to get by where there is no doctor. And so I see philosophy as something a bit similar. Uh, it's the enterprise of where there is no scientist, um, where there is no method, because it's something we didn't talk about much, but a craft isn't only constituted by having an end. Um, you know, we could all have the end of being healthy. Um, what's constitutive of being a doctor is you've got methods for attaining that end. Um, you've got a system which is reliable at producing it. And so my somewhat pessimistic way of reframing Alexander's point would be to say uh, that philosophy is the mode of truth-oriented intellectual inquiry which we're engaged in where we don't have a method and don't really uh, know or at least don't agree about what the right method would be. Um, so I think that's probably the note to end on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our participants today have had a lot to say, and so we've arrived naturally at the, um, the, the period when we, the moment when we have to end today's session, but I just want to invite as many of you as can make it to come back tomorrow, uh, where we'll default to a seminar format. The commentators will have another go at this material. Rachel will make a few remarks, and we should have ample time uh, for open discussion with the audience. So I'm, I'm sorry, Johan and others, that um, <laughs> you're going to have to save your questions for tomorrow. But um, please come back if you're able to do so. But before that, uh, join me in, in once again thanking Rachel and our commentators.